If you or a loved one is living with cancer, you probably have two focal points, how to rid yourself of it and how to prevent it from coming back. You'll get some terrific information today on Cancer Concepts and Compliments with Dr. James Belanger. We'll explore natural medicines which may enhance conventional therapies, share cutting-edge research, and offer insight on how diet and natural medicines can play an important role in treating and preventing cancer. The information presented herein is in no way intended as a substitute for medical counseling. Now, here is Dr. James Belanger. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cancer Concepts and Compliments. I'm your host, Dr. James Belanger from the Lexington Natural Health Center in Lexington, Massachusetts. Today's topic is renal cell cancer or kidney cancer. Um, it's not as common a cancer as other types that I've been talking about, but there's about 63,000 new cases in the U.S. every year, and 13 or so thousand people do die from it every year in the U.S. from kidney cancer. Um, so a lot, lot to talk about on how to improve those statistics today with natural medicines combining it with the conventional therapies. But if it's, if it's caught early, it can be very curable. If it's, if it's just isolated to the kidney in less than about 7 centimeters in early stage, stage 1, over 50% of people can be cured. But um, most of the stage 4 cancer, kidney cancer with conventional alone, is incurable to the even with today's advanced uh, medicines. So there's all kinds of natural things I want to talk to you today to improve those statistics because conventional therapy alone is not good enough, unfortunately, for stage 4 kidney cancer. And um, there's a whole host of research that's being conducted on natural medicines making the conventional therapies work better and even some natural medicines that by themselves can have a substantial effect on kidney cancer in animal models. Uh, but 40% of all patients with uh, kidney cancer survive about five years. Um, and there's some cases where it just goes away on its own. Um, I'm going to talk about that later when the immune system starts to be able to see the cancer and respond to it. Then sometimes it goes away on its own. But there's natural things that can get the immune system to start to react to the cancer and see it. Because uh, there's many ways kidney cancer and other cancers can, should we say, hide from the immune system. And once you get it exposed to the immune system, the immune system can start to react better. Today's topic, I'm going to mainly talk about uh, adenocarcinoma. It, there's different types of kidney cancer, but most of them are called adenocarcinoma, um, or, origin from the, originating from the glandular part of the, uh, the kidney and the, the proximal tubular. And there's this one called clear cell. That's going to be most of today's topic. There, there is another type, transitional cell carcinoma. Uh, but I, most of the research that I'm, I'm going to be discussing has been conducted in adenocarcinoma in, in uh, animal models and in human models. But chemotherapy is not really the uh, uh, main treatment for kidney cancer. Only about 10% responses for most chemotherapy regimens. So most of the uh, research is being conducted on inhibiting blood vessels. So that's what I'm going to talk mostly about is natural things that inhibit blood vessels and make the um, blood vessel inhibiting drugs work better. But yeah, blood vessels seem to be a, play a big role with kidney cancer because most of this, the clear cell adenocarcinoma, they can contain mutations that activate blood vessel pathways. In order for a cancer, a kidney cancer, to grow more than a few millimeters, it needs to make its own blood supply. It's not getting enough blood from the existing kidney, so it starts to make its own blood, blood vessels, and that's how it's able to grow more than a few millimeters and many, many centimeters and then spread places. And there's all these pathways that are involved in blood vessel growth, and uh, so that's why they've created these drugs that inhibit various pathways. The main drug that's being used when people are first diagnosed with uh, kidney cancer is sunitinib, or sutent, it's called. And it inhibits all these different um, blood vessel growth factors and receptors that lead to growth. Blood vessels are not just created in one way in in cancer. There's many uh, compounds and growth factors that are involved in the production of blood vessels. And if you just block one of those growth factors, then the cancer can um, use other things to make those blood vessels. I'll give you an analogy. So if you're going to you know, build a house and you, you know, want to build it out of uh, wood or something, and we took the wood away, well, you'll just start building a brick house or a cement house. 
But if you, we take all those different things away, then it's harder to build that house. There's many things. There's one thing called PDGF, platelet-derived growth factor. There's something called VEGF, vascular growth factor. There's something called FGF, fibroblastic growth factor, and numerous other growth factors that play a role with blood vessel growth in kidney cancer. And um, this sunitinib or sutan inhibits the VEGF and the PDGF and a few other ones. And that's, that's why it can be uh, effective at the beginning of, of slowing down the cancer. Um, but unfortunately, there's more than just those few that I just mentioned. There's other ones that I'm going to talk about a little later that can uh, override the sunitinib, but there's natural medicines that might address those. But sunitinib uh, has an overall response of about 31%. 31% of people with metastatic kidney cancer that go on it have some kind of shrinkage or at least it keeps it stable. And that lasts for about 11 months and then it often starts progressing. So it doesn't work in 100%, about 31%, and then it progresses in 11 months. Um, it, compared to uh, an old therapy that is still being used here and there, um, interferon, it does look to be uh, somewhat better. Um, people that go on interferon therapy start to often progress within five months afterwards. But overall survival, it's not that much better than interferon in terms of overall survival, about five months more. But it, and it has side effects, diarrhea and liver toxicity. Um, but why, why does it you know, work forever? How does, it, how does the cancer get around it? Well, they've done lots of research on how the cancer gets around sunitinib, and uh, let's talk about each one of those. So one thing is that the cancer starts to upregulate various what's called inflammatory cytokines. When the cancer upregulates inflammatory cytokines, it, it um, can work itself around the sunitinib to become resistant. There's a study done at, right here in Massachusetts at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2009, where they measured these various inflammatory compounds in the blood of people with kidney cancer and found, actually it was a, sorry, it was a, a liver cancer study, but the, um, they used the same drug, sunitinib, for liver cancer. Um, so the same thing can apply. This leads to resistance to sunitinib is inflammatory cytokines start to get upregulated. There's one called interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is a, uh, a, a chemical released by our immune system. It's released by the kidney cancer cells themselves and cells that surround the kidney cancer. But it's really important with uh, inhibiting cell death. So it's a way that the uh, kidney cancer can stop from dying in response to uh, the sunitinib. It's uh, also necessary for it to um, by, uh, cause platelets to start to manufacture more VEGF to uh, more growth factors to help get um, the fuel it needs. It's like giving, giving an analogy again, if, 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 if you have all this wood or bricks and you're building this house and I took it away, well, you might you know, start getting on the phone and calling some trucks to come over with lots of deliveries to try to stop me from taking away your materials. And so interleukin-6 is something that causes our bone marrow to release platelets that are packed full of VEGF, uh, a growth factor that's needed for blood vessels. And um, so these platelets will start to arrive at the site, like trucks arriving with full of this VEGF to override the sunitinib that way. So that's how it works. And then there's other things that interleukin-6 induces something called HGF, which is another growth factor, hepatocyte growth factor needed to help um, with blood vessel production. So that's one thing. So you can measure interleukin-6 in the blood. It's a simple test, various labs, Quest Diagnostics, LabCorp has that, and it can be done. And if it's elevated, anything over um, 2 uh, milligrams milli, uh, per liter, I think it's the unit, is considered high and needs to be lowered. And I'm going to mention some natural things that can do that. But um, this study that was done at Mass General Hospital also uh, measured a few other things, something called stromal-derived factor or SDF1. SDF1 is uh, something that um, is released by what's called fibroblasts that surround the cancer. And they, they help um, the bone marrow release these immature uh, white cells called myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And these myeloid-derived suppressor cells um, come into the area and inhibit killer cell attack, inhibit the immune system's ability to attack 
Plus, the myelodrive suppressor cells create um, blood vessel growth factors and things, too. So that's why if F SDF, stromal-derived factor, is elevated in the blood, it also leads to resistance. So that's something that can be measured, and there's natural things that affect that. And the, the other thing that they found in the study was something called soluble C-kit. If that was elevated in the blood, then that leads to overriding. And that is a, um, uh, just another growth factor um, that's involved with blood vessel growth. So it's, it's, you take away something from the cancer, the cancer responds and tries to override that. Um, but, and that's, that's the trouble with using one drug. Um, you know, there's, cancer, there's so many pathways involved with cancer growth that it's a lot more successful to combine things. But when you combine various drugs with each other, you get more toxicity. That's where the uh, natural medicines can, uh, could, could play a good role because they often have a lot less toxicities um, that they can, com can be combined. It's not like free of toxicity, but they um, are less likely to raise liver enzymes and cause all, you know, problems with uh, hair loss and uh, diarrhea and this and that. Um, so they could be combined with it um, to help. So that's what I'm going to outline some of the studies that, that show that when you start using more than just one thing against cancer, then you could maybe have a, a more profound effect. Another mechanism of, of resistance um, that was demonstrated in this Mass General um, Hospital study was that, uh, if again, if sunitinib takes away growth factor um, pathways that are needed to form blood vessels, the cancer will release signals that cause the bone marrow to release um, what's called progenitor cells, cells that give rise to blood vessels. Um, so the bone marrow is like a factory for, for things like platelets that I just mentioned, and platelets are um, responsible for blood vessel growth, but bone marrow can also um, release um, cells that lead to um, blood vessel formation. They're called endothelial cells. They're cells that line our blood vessels. And the bone marrow can produce them and release them into the blood, and then they migrate to the cancer and start forming. Again, it's like more deliveries being made, um, and that's how it overcomes it. So um, there's research that's done in the Angiogenesis Journal in 2009 showing that patients that have high levels of circulating endothelial cells, cells that are, um, of, give rise to blood vessels, um, were more likely to have resistance to sunitinib and that those started to increase as time went on in people on sunitinib and uh, led to resistance. And uh, it's, it's induced by something called plasma VEGF, which um, we can measure, and I'll talk about that later. But you can measure endothelial cells in the blood, too, and making sure that they're not rising in somebody that's on sunitinib. So what's some of natural medicines that might make sunitinib work better that work through some of these mechanisms? Well, the first one is called tetrathiomolybdate. I'll spell that one. T-E-T-R-A, tetra, that means four. Thio, T-H-I-O, which is sulfur. And molybdate, M-O-L-Y-B as in boy, D as in dog, A-T-E. Tetrathiomolybdate. Molybdate is a, is a, a, a mineral, molybdenum. Um, it's found in the periodic table, found in our food supply. Well, tetrathiomolybdate is a compound actually formed in the rumens of animals. So um, when they're eating, when animals are eating soil that, or, or you know, grass that has the soil that contains molybdenum in it, the bacteria in their rumen convert it into this thing called tetrathiomolybdate, four sulfurs attached to molybdenum. And um, they, they found that, you know, some animals were becoming anemic and their white cell counts were dropping. And they eventually, some researcher tested and found out that it was because of this tetrathiomolybdate that was forming in their stomachs because the soil had a lot of molybdenum in it. Well, then they started using this for this disease called Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease is a, uh, a condition where we absorb too much copper from our diets, and it can cause trouble with the liver and the nervous system. And they found that this tetrathiomolybdate uh, inhibits copper um, absorption in the body. And so some researchers done uh, in uh, Wisconsin decided to study this for cancer because it, it was starting to become known that copper um, can be involved in blood vessel growth. For example, copper is found to stimulate the uh, migration of those endothelial cells, those blood vessel cells, from the bone marrow to cancer. And it's also involved with uh, VEGF or vascular growth factor production and 
FGF, fibroblastic growth factor production. So it's needed for blood vessels. And um, so too much copper might not be good for people with cancer. Um, and r lowering copper to a, 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 a low level but not a com completely deficient level might help control cancer. So that's, they did a, a study, phase two study, human study, in people with kidney cancer published in the Clinical Cancer Research Journal in 2003. They took, well, not too many people, and unfortunately it hasn't been a follow-up to this study, but only 13 people with advanced kidney cancer who had not responded to this interleukin-2, um, which not too many people respond to that, but they didn't respond to that, and, and then they were progressing on other therapies. They gave them this tetrathiamolybdate, which um, is classified as a drug because it is... Um, um, you know, something used for Wilson's disease, and it's, it's you know, it, it is formed in these, the animal rumens, but it's something that's um, not going to easily get out of your food supply. So, but it is a drug, but it is contain, contains sulfur, molybdenum, so it's kind of in the natural realm. That's why I'm mentioning it. Well, they gave that uh, both with food to inhibit copper absorption from food, and they gave it away from food to help um, inhibit copper um, in, in the body. And um, there's this blood test. It's called ceruloplasmin. Ceruloplasmin is a blood test that indicates uh, copper status in the body. And they found, and then they gave this tetrathiamolybdate, and it lowers the ceruloplasm down to a level between five and fifteen, when normal levels are around like thirty. So they brought it down to induce like a marginal copper deficiency in the body, and it kept the disease stable in thirty-one percent of those patients. So four out of the thirteen patients for up to 34 weeks, which is quite good, um, you know, when you, and these are people that already failed other therapies. Um, and it was pretty well tolerated. Uh, you, you, the copper level, that ceruloplasmum level, has to be monitored on this therapy um, because you do need some copper. If you don't have any copper, you can get anemic and it can lower your white cells. So similar like a chemotherapy would. So if you, if you took this product without being monitored, um, uh, then it can cause anemia from copper deficiency or uh, a low white cell from copper deficiency. But as long as it's monitored and this blood test ceruloplasm is done pretty regularly, maybe one every, once every uh, couple weeks, and the right dose, um, a, st a fixed dose is given once a person gets to that range and a person's not eating high copper foods like um, Brazil nuts can be really high in copper, oysters, then uh, the uh, copper levels will come down and it could start inhibiting blood vessels. And it affects, like I mentioned, those endothelial cells. So that's something that could be measured to see if that's staying down. Um, it affects interleukin-6, that, that other compound that I mentioned. So that could be measured and making sure that's coming down and certainly measuring the ceruloplasm. Um, but it's pretty well tolerated. Some people get some gas from it because it has sulfur in it. Um, but um, it doesn't cause diarrhea, it doesn't cause uh, you know, neuropathy, it doesn't cause liver toxicity like some of the medications. Um, so something to, to look into as well. And a doctor can prescribe that. It's only available in pharmacies. Okay, when I get back, I'm going to talk about some other natural medicines like cabbage family vegetables in kidney cancer. This is Cancer Concepts and Compliments. <music> This is Cancer Concepts and Compliments with Dr. James Belanger. The information presented herein is in no way intended as a substitute for medical counseling. If you would like to find out more about the Lexington Natural Health Center, please visit LexingtonNaturalHealth.com. That's LexingtonNaturalHealth.com. Now, back to this week's program. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Cancer Concepts and Compliments. I'm your host, Dr. James Belanger. Okay, so let's continue our discussion of natural things that might help allow sutinitinib or sutent to work uh, better and longer. So another thing that that Mass General study said that was that stromal derived factor is another compound that if it starts to elevate in the blood can lead to resistance to sunitinib. So that's something that can be measured, SDF1, um, and if it's elevated, there's not really much natural things that have been studied, but what I have found uh, clinically um, is cruciferous vegetables can play a role. And there was a, a study done in a medical hypothesis in 2006 that led me to uh, go down this path showing that um, cabbage in particular has, uh, which is in the cruciferous family, has high amounts of tannic acid, 
very high levels of tannic acid. That same thing that's in tea, but cabbage has more of this tannic acid in it. And the tannic acid in breast cancer cells inhibited SDF. And so um, I always encourage people to eat a lot of cruciferous vegetables, especially cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, collard greens, and that is something that um, it could affect the SDF. So if you started seeing that rise, um, eating more of those can help lower that. So that's a nice food thing to do. Um, that, that goes with a lot of cancers, that cruciferous vegetables, the cabbage family vegetables, have a really potent effect. And there happens to be a study done in China in the PLOS1 journal in 2013 showing that the more people ate cabbage, the lower the risk of getting kidney cancer. And that might be one of the reasons uh, is affecting this F SDF, which is a growth, growth factor. SDF tends to be increased by something called HIF. When, when, when the cancer cells are getting deprived of the blood vessels that they need um, to grow because of the sunitinib, um, what's called hypoxia starts to be induced. The cancer is not getting enough of its blood supply, so it's not getting enough oxygen, so that it, it, it has low levels of oxygen, and it releases this compound, HIF, which is called hypoxia-inducible factor, low oxygen hypoxia, and, and that induces more blood vessels to come in, um, uh, and that, that can trigger this SDF to be formed. And there's this uh, compound called Indian gooseberry. Indian gooseberry, so it's a berry found in India, uh, also called amla, which I found very good at lowering SDF as well because it targets this thing called HIF. So that's another thing. It hasn't really been studied for kidney cancer. A lot of its research is being done in ovarian cancer right now, but a lot of these mechanisms are very similar. Then there's this C-kit that I talked about before. C-kit, soluble C-kit is another thing that can lead to overriding in sunitinib, and that can be measured, soluble C-kit, and resveratrol, that compound found in grapes, is very useful for that. But unfortunately, that's not it. There's so many things that induce blood vessel growth that, again, sunitinib affects a few things. Cancer overrides it by making other things. And by combining um, other things with the sunitinib might get a, some better results. And using the lab to help determine what is going on in the cancer before it starts to become resistant and progresses. So you measure SDF1, you measure soluble C-kit, you measure endothelial cells in the blood, you measure interleukin-6, and then you also measure what's called angiopoietin. Angiopoietin, it's another blood vessel growth factor that, um, according to research done also here in Boston, Beth Israel Hospital, Translational Oncology in 2014. This one was done in kidney cancer patients, showing that patients had high levels of this angiopoietin number two in their blood um, were more likely to have resistance developing to sunitinib. Um, they found that it initially decreases when people are having responses to sunitinib, but then it starts to rise in the blood as its sunitinib is wearing off. And that inhibiting angiopoietin with another drug um, helps make sunitinib work better. Um, but there are those drugs that inhibit angiopoietin are not available right now in clinical trials. But there's natural medicines that can inhibit angiopoietin that are readily available over the counter. And one of them I'm sure you've heard of is curcumin. Curcumin is that compound found in turmeric, the Indian spice. Tons of research being conducted on that. Um, certainly more needs to be um, you know, billions of dollars need to be spent and somebody's got to fund that to take curcumin to the next level and have it be an approved therapy for cancer. But it is, it's readily available and there's been some studies done in uh, the Biochemical Biophysical Research uh, Communications Journal in India, 2002, showing that curcumin given um, to mice reduces angiopoietin. And that's what, where I got that research from and, and I have seen that work clinically. Um, and so that's something that can be measured. There is a study in test tubes showing in the anti-cancer agent um, medicinal chemistry 2013 showing that curcumin in, in uh, you know, cell cultures can make sunitinib work better, that they found that, that it, it increases its activity by fourfold in a, a test tube. Um, and part of it might be because of its effects on angiopoietin and, and numerous other things. So that would be a really interesting study doing a human study um, combining curcumin with uh, sunitinib and then seeing if it really makes it work better um, like they've seen in the, these um, test tube and animal studies.
The other thing that lowers angiopoietin is neem leaf. It's another uh, Indian uh, herb. It's a, a tree that grows commonly in India, and the leaf has compounds in it called uh, glycoproteins, neem leaf glycoproteins, that have an effect um, on um, the uh, angiopoietin. And there's a study done in Cancer Biology Therapeutics 2014 in Texas where they gave animals um, uh, injections that it causes cancer and then they gave them neem leaf extract. So they took the leaf and they extracted it in alcohol and then they injected it into the animals. And they found that it reduces um, angiopoietin by fourfold, fourfold reduction in angiopoietin. And it also affected another blood vessel growth factor, the VEGF growth factor, by tenfold. So that's another thing that should be studied. Again, no, nothing uh, studied on that with uh, sunitinib, but all kinds of research being done on neem leaf for all kinds of cancers. It also has a, a profound effect on the immune system, which makes it a very... Um, interesting uh, compound to study because it's been shown to reduce some of those myeloid-derived suppressor cells that I mentioned that inhibit the killer cells attacking cancer, and it also inhibits these blood vessels. So it has an immune effect and an uh, effect on blood vessel growth factors. Um, so, and it affects angiopoietin, which leads to resistance to sunitinib. There's another blood vessel growth factor. It's called interleukin-8, and there's another study that was done showing when those th that rises in the blood, it leads to sunitinib resistance because it's another blood vessel growth factor. Again, you take away the bricks and the wood. I just build a house out of stone and cement. You take all that stuff away from me, then it's going to be harder for me to build my house, and um, that's where the natural medicines come in because there are natural things that affect interleukin-8. But yeah, there's a study done in Cancer Research 2010 in Michigan showing that uh, interleukin-8 will increase, leads to sunitinib resistance by causing more uh, blood vessels to grow. And feverfew has been studied to inhibit interleukin-8 in mice given renal cell cancer or kidney cancer. Done in Japan in the International Journal of Cancer in 2007. They gave animals uh, renal cell carcinoma, the clear cell, and they gave them oral doses of something found in feverfew, a plant called parthenolide. They gave a massive dose of this compound found in feverfew uh, pure, they didn't give fever few whole, but they just this compound parthenolide. And then they found that uh, the tumor volume was one half the size after eight weeks. And its mechanism of action was one thing that it did was it decreased interleukin-8. And interleukin-8 is a blood vessel growth factor. But it didn't just do that. It also affected VEGF, um, another blood vessel growth factor. And it decreased um, some things that lead to uh, inhibiting cell death. It decreased them, something called BCL, XL, and, um, and it affects something called COX-2, so all kinds of things like that. Um, it inhibited this thing called COX-2, and there's research that's been done in British Journal of Cancer 2013 showing that uh, uh, COX-2 inhibitors um, also make sunitinib work better, and that might be the reason how um, parthenolide from feverfew also made sunitinib work better. So um, uh, very interesting stuff there. Um, genistein is something that has been shown to help lower interleukin-8. It's been studied by itself, not with sunitinib, but by itself in the journal Urology 2004, showing that it can in decrease blood vessel growth in kidney cancer uh, in animal models. So that's another thing that I'll commonly use. So it's a simple test, interleukin-8. You measure it at lab, a lab core is the lab that I use. Um, I think that's the only lab that, that I know that has that test. It's done in a blood test, and normal levels are under 66, so I'll do a blood test on the people, and then if they're on sunitinib over time, check it every couple months, and if I start seeing it rise, then, then there are things like this parthenolide. There's these compounds found in soybean called genistein, diazine, that might help. There are a few other things that I've found. They haven't been studied, unfortunately, um, but I found clinically they do lower interleukin-8. There's one that's called vascustatin, uh, or the plant is called convolvulus, the bindweed plant. That has been studied in um, PR Health Science Journal 2002, showing that it can inhibit blood vessels in, in another tumor called the fibrosarcoma. Um, but I've found that the, how it lowers blood vessels is by lowering interleukin-8. 
There's uh, research in breast cancer patients showing that a couple B vitamins, niacin, riboflavin, and something called coenzyme Q10 lower interleukin-8. So there's a whole host of natural things that can keep that interleukin-8 from rising. And according to that research done at uh, the, in Michigan, showing that interleukin-8 can lead to resistance to sinitinib, it's something that would um, be interesting to see more done. But clinically, um, these are things that I use to lower interleukin-8. And then, then there's more, unfortunately. There's something called osteopontin. It's another thing that can rise, lead, leading to resistance. It, it's um, induced also by that HIF thing that I was talking about that do, induces SDF. So that's how it uh, leads to more blood vessels, and it helps cancer migrate and become more invasive and survive. Uh, it's called osteopontin. And they found in the journal ACTA Oncology, that patients with um, renal cell carcinoma um, have, when they start having elevated levels of osteopontin in the blood, that the state they 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 have more advanced disease and shorter survivals. And there's research done in Berlin, um, Journal of Cancer Research, Clinical Oncology in 2007, showing that when osteopontin levels rise in the blood, it leads to resistance to sunitinib. And so that's why it's important to monitor osteopontin and lower it. Um, very few research studies being done on natural things or even drugs that lower osteopontin, but um, there's a couple of studies done and on things that I have found clinically help lower osteopontin to help keep it down. Um, and according to that research that's been done in, in Berlin, um, that it, if, if you get that down, that might allow sunitinib to work longer and other uh, drugs that are being used for, uh, for uh, kidney cancer. But one thing that lowers it that's been studied in breast cancer in animals in the current um, Molecular Medicine Journal 2012 is an herb called andrographis. Andrographis is an Indian herb. Um, it has many effects against cancer um, that's been studied. One of it is it affects this osteopontin, so it takes away that blood vessel growth factor. It um, also lowers interleukin-6, what I see clinically. And I mentioned that um, earlier in that study that was done at Mass General showing that interleukin-6, when that rises in the blood, that can lead to resistance to sunitinib as well. So andrographis um, has multitude effects. It even may affect VEGF and help with the immune response against cancer. So it's a, a very uh, uh, multi, uh, uh, multifunctional herb that should be studied more for kidney cancer. Coptis chinensis, or Chinese gold thread, has also been shown to lower osteopontin in, um, in another squamous cell carcinoma, um, another type of cancer. VEGF is something that also can be measured in the blood. So you, you get my um, um, hint here. It's very important to monitor. You don't want to just go on sunitinib and hope for the best, and then when it wears off, go on another drug and another drug. You want to get as much life out of one drug as you can, you know, before you go on something else, because usually the first one is what's going to work the best, and ones after that don't typically work as well. And they know so much about how the resistance happens, but there's very little that is being done right now to overcome those resistant mechanisms. But the lab can indicate that there's some resistance trying to develop and to tell you, you know, tell a practitioner what to do to try to stop that. Interleukin-6 rises while well, you have andrographis, tetrathalmolybdate, different things like that that might help. Um, but VEGF can be measured in the blood, and that's another thing that, according to some research done at the British uh, Medical uh, BMC Journal, whatever that stands for, cancer in 2009 in Greece, where they took 42 patients with renal cell cancer, uh, cancer and gave them sunitinib and found that patients that did not respond had high levels of plasma VEGF after first two cycles. And, uh, and then if they had you know, higher pl plasma VEGF, they had lower progression-free survival. So um, plasma VEGF is, or VEGF is something that leads to blood vessel growth. And by it going up in the blood, it releases more of those precursor cells that lead to the blood vessels. So it causes the bone marrow to start to release these endothelial cells, which then migrate in there, like the trucks coming to deliver more um, materials or more uh, uh, components that are needed to make blood vessels. So that's why it's important to monitor VEGF in the plasma, in the blood, making sure that it's not going up and using natural things to keep it down if it does look like it's on the rise in, in somebody on sunitinib. Well, the things that have been studied to inhibit 
or decreased VEGF that actually been studied in, in renal cell cancer um, are cartilage products, cartilage from cows, bovine cartilage, and cartilage from sharks. So cartilage does not contain blood vessels. Cartilage in our body um, gets its nutrients from the synovial fluid that bathes it. And so there's no blood vessels in cartilage, and so there are some natural inhibitors to blood vessels found in cartilage. That's what made them study it in the first place. Well, there's a, an old study in 1985 using bovine cartilage from cows, and the product was called Catrix, C-A-T-R-I-X, which is available, but they gave injections to nine people with cancers, and um, one of them had kidney cancer. It, was, it wasn't just kidney cancer. Nine patients with different types of cancer, but the patient with the kidney cancer had a complete response, which is interesting because um, blood vessel growth inhibitors seem to have a, a, a really profound effect in kidney cancer more so than other ones, kidney cancer and, like mentioned, the primary liver cancer. But sunitinib is not um, commonly used as a primary therapy for many types of cancer. Um, but the, uh, this bovine cartilage inhibits blood vessels, in, including like VEGF, the thing I mentioned, and this one patient had a, a, a complete response to it. They didn't mention how long that response was in that study, and there hasn't been any follow-ups. But it's something that I have found clinically that cartilage um, products can lower VEGF plasma, at least, um, and affect some other blood vessels. There's also been research done in shark cartilage, too. Now, shark cartilage, uh, initially, w there was a lot of excitement about it, and there was this company, Lane Labs, that was promoting it, and then, then there was a negative study, and then it kind of lost its favor. But they've continued doing more research in Canada um, on shark cartilage extracts and making them more, uh, more powerful, um, using water extracts and concentrating certain fractions of shark cartilage. And there's this product, it's called NeoVastat, that they've done phase two and phase three clinical studies done in Quebec, um, showing that there's effects in um, renal cell cancer. And its mechanism of action is inhibiting the binding of VEGF to its receptor, so stopping that. But it also affects some other blood vessel growth factor called MMP9 and MMP2. These are things that I'll talk about later that have been shown to lead to resistance to sunitinib 2 So there's a study done in the Annals of Oncology in 2002 in Quebec where they gave 22 patients with refractory renal cell carcinoma, meaning that they weren't, were not responding to other types of therapies um, like interferon, interleukin-2 back in 2002. And the median survival um, increased to 16 months if they gave them a large dose, 240 milliliters a day. And it was very well tolerated. So um, it, it improved their survival compared to seven months. Um, the, uh, they de then they did a phase three study in the Journal of Urology in 2007 where they took, again, patients that failed immune therapies and they gave them this larger dose of NeoVastat 120 milliliters twice a day, and they found that survival increased from 457 to 947 days. If they had, um, they, they didn't have a lot of metastasis, if they only had one site where there was metastasis um, and they were good performance status, they were feeling good, and they had that clear cell type of adenocarcinoma rather than other types. So uh, it does seem to be, you know, have a specific selection process. It affects VEGF and MMPs. So if somebody has an elevated level of VEGF in the blood or elevated levels of MMPs in the blood, shark cartilage or maybe the bovine cartilage, but the shark cartilage has a lot more research on it, could be um, useful. The, um, this NeoVastat is not available, um, but there are products that um, I found clinically work at, at lowering VEGF and MMPs. Um, and one is by this a lab called Douglas Labs called Comitris. It's a uh, shark cartilage that comes frozen um, on dry ice, and it's a liquid one. So the powders don't seem to have as much of an effect. Okay, I've got to take another break. This is Cancer Concepts and Compliments. <music> This is Cancer Concepts and Compliments with Dr. James Belanger. The information presented herein is in no way intended as a substitute for medical counseling. If you would like to find out more about the Lexington Natural Health Center, please visit LexingtonNaturalHealth.com. That's LexingtonNaturalHealth.com. Now, back to this week's program. 
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Cancer Concepts and Compliments. So let's continue our discussion about some natural medicines that may help sunitinib work better and some laboratory tests that can um, be used to uh, uh, determine what, what to use in addition to sunitinib. But there's this other blood vessel growth factor called MMP9 and MMP2 that have been shown to lead to resistance to sunitinib. And I was mentioning that shark cartilage has been shown to inhibit that. MMP stands for matrix metalloproteinase. They're enzymes, they're also called collagenases, collagen breaking down. It breaks down collagen. And collagen is found not just under our skin, but surrounding, you know, cancer cells. It's part of our connective tissue. It, it's a support structure. And cancer cells can release MMPs and, and blood vessels and cells that surround the cancer can release it to break down what's in the way um, so those blood vessels can go in to the cancer. Just like you got a bunch of trees in the way of your road that's going to your house, you cut them down so the road can get there. So MMPs are considered blood vessel growth factors as well. And that can be measured in the blood. And there's research done in the Urology Oncology Journal in 2014 in Japan. Patients with sunitinib, if they had higher levels of MMP9 um, in their blood, that they're uh, going to not respond after a while to sunitinib. So that's something that shark cartilage might help. Um, there's also been research done in something called salibinin, which is a, a compound found in milk thistle milk thistle, the plant, showing that it also um, it reduces the uh, uh, growth of renal cell carcinoma. The study was done in molecular carcinogenesis 2011, showing there was a 70% reduction in tumor volume and a 69% reduction in tumor weight in animals that were fed salibinin, this compound found in milk thistle. And uh, the mechanism of action is it decreases MMP9 and UPA and other things that are needed for blood vessel growth. So between that and shark cartilage, those are the things that have been studied. I also have found various things found in berries called bioflavonoids also affect MMPs. But I, I'm not aware of any research being done on that in kidney cancer, but certainly other cancers. Another thing that can be monitored in the blood that leads to resistance is called GMCSF granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, GMCSF. And there's a study done in Japan in the Molecular Clinical Oncology 2014 showing that patients on sunitinib, if they had rises in their GMCSF level in the blood, that they're more likely to have progressive disease. And how does that work? GMCSF helps prolong the survival of those myeloid-derived suppressor cells. The myeloid-derived suppressor cells suppress the immune system and they migrate around the cancer and they're released from the bone marrow. They migrate around the cancer and they protect the cancer against the, um, the uh, natural killer cells and the killer T cells. And so that's how um, it survives. And it also leads to blood vessel growth as well. So that's why it's important to, to target that. So what lowers GM CSF? Well, it's something that can be measured in the blood. LabCorp is a lab that has that. Um, and, uh, and it's also measured by a lab called uh, Pharmacin Labs. They measure the production of it from our white cells. But if it comes back elevated, there's an herb called Borhavia diffusa. It's another herb found in India. Um, it's, they often eat the leaves, supposedly, in India as a vegetable. It's also called puna, punarnava, punarnava um, which means rejuvenate um, in Ayurvedic medicine. But it's called Barhavia diffusa. And there's a, a study done in the Journal of Ex Experimental Therapeutics and Oncology, 2008, showing that that given as an injection to animals greatly inhibits the GMCSF level. And at the same time, it lowers that interleukin-6 thing. So that's what makes it a very um, useful agent that might make um, sunitinib work better. What's really nice about Borhavia is it also helps the immune system function better against cancer. It increases something called interleukin-2, which is, has been used for kidney cancer. Um, doesn't have the greatest effects by itself, but it is necessary to help our killer cells become activated. Um, Borhavia helps increase our own body's production of interleukin-2 and at the same time helps uh, reduce these inflammatory cytokines uh, like interleukin-6 and GM-CSF that leads to resistance. 
So that's very interesting. There's another uh, thing that last thing that should be measured in anybody that's on sunitinib and all these other drugs that we'll be talking about for kidney cancer. It's called C-reactor protein. C-reactor protein is a measure of inflammation. And if it's high, um, it leads to uh, worse case scenarios in people with kidney cancer. So it's something that needs to be kept under control. There's a study done in France in the British or the BJU International Journal 2014 where they measured CRP in patients, and if it was over five, the progression-free survival was eight months. If it was less than five, it was 25 months. So big difference keeping that CRP down. CRP goes up with interleukin-6, and so some of the things I've mentioned for interleukin-6 can help keep that down. Um, resveratrol is one of my favorite agents for keeping C-reactive protein down, but there's numerous other things. So that's something that should be monitored and um, and kept in check so it doesn't lead to resistance to sunitinib. There's one natural medicine that there is research showing that you shouldn't take if you're on sunitinib uh, or even drink. Green tea is the thing. That green tea can reduce the, um, the uh, blood levels of sunitinib affecting its ability. That, that's what they found. They didn't say that it interfered um, with the mechanism of it, but you, you won't get as much sunitinib in the blood um, to have an effect in the body against the cancer if you're on green tea. And that was even drinking that. That was done in China. However, green tea um, does have all kinds of effects on blood vessels and stuff. So what would have been interesting to see is does the green tea actually interfere with the mechanisms of sunitinib? It certainly lowers the amount of it, but if it potentiates um, um, its um, other anti-cancer effects or green tea has anti-cancer effects too, that it might not lead to total inhibition of it. That All they said was that it reduces the blood level of sunitinib, and that might then interfere. But green tea, I use all the time to lower VEGF, for example, lower MMPs. It's, it, it affects these other things. So I wish they would do more research on that to see if it really does interfere with sunitinib. But for now, it's best to stay away from green tea if you're on sunitinib. There's other things if sunitinib starts not working. One's called exitinib um, and serafinib. And then there's something called Votrian or Prezotinib. Um, but there's um, a lot of these are pretty new. But Serafinib, let's talk about some research that's been done on that. So, serafinib is a drug often given, like I mentioned, when sunitinib stops working. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't last you know, forever. P patients that were on sunitinib first line and then go to Serafinib, they start to progress four months later. So Serafinib just helps for four months before it stops working. Um, and so anything that could make serafinib work better um, should be studied more. Well, there's a study done in Philadelphia in the International Journal of Cancer in 2010. This was, again, done in a liver cancer where they get used serafinib as well, but um, the mechanism could apply for kidney cancer. But they gave vitamin K1, vitamin K1, the vitamin that's found in dark green leafy vegetables like spinach and kale, and they gave it as an injection to animals with this hepatocellular carcinoma, with serafinib or by itself. Well, the vitamin K by itself um, didn't have any effect on the cancer. The serafinib reduced the tumor weight from 30 grams to 25 grams, so it had a little bit of an effect. But when the serafinib was combined with vitamin K, after 14 days, the tumor weight was zero, <laughs> zero grams compared to the control, which was 30 grams. Serafinib alone, 25 grams. So it basically stopped the cancer from growing completely. Um, K1 plus serafinib. And how did it work? Well, serafinib affects some of those blood vessel growth factors that I mentioned before, the VEGF, the PDGF, but it also affects something called RAF, um, BRAF. Um, and uh, K1 also affects BRAF in a different way. So they, they both inhibited BRAF in this different way. And so that's how it had a, 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 a synergistic effect. Very, very profound effect. Simple vitamin, vitamin K1 plus serafinib. So it's something that needs to be looked in further. Then there's another compound called hymacromone. Hymacromone. It's a natural compound actually found in celery and carrots and parsnips and fennel, the umbiliferone, umbiliferae family. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's also called methylcoumarin, 
but it's a natural substance and it's actually you know used in Europe and Asia to help um, um, with you know uh, bile spasms, bile duct spasms from uh, gallbladder issues and things like that. And it's it has very little toxicity. It it doesn't um, inhibit the blood like other coumarins. So it's very well tolerated and it's it's sold under the name of Hepervit and Cantalbaline. So it, it's it's used commonly in other uh, countries. But there's a research study done in the Journal of Urology in Miami finding that um, it, it could help make uh, serafinib work better in animals with kidney cancer. And the mechanism of action is it inhibits the production of something called hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is needed to help um, basically with blood vessel growth and needed for uh, in, invasiveness of the cancer and um, helping it spread places like that. So they used a, um, a, a large dose of this hyperchromone in, uh, in this uh, animal model, and then they gave that combined with serafinib. And the, 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 uh, the hyperchromone inhibited the tumor volume by one half. The serafinib had no activity in this particular test. It didn't do anything compared to control. The hyperchromone reduced the tumor volume by half, and the combination almost completely inhibited the growth, the combination of serafinib plus hyperchromone. So something very interesting to be studied. And lastly, let's talk about the immune system. The, there are some therapies, like I mentioned, interferon, interleukin-2, that have had some very small objective responses in people with kidney cancer. But the um, reason why they don't have a full effect is because they're only affecting one part of the immune system. Well, um, there's been research done on an herb called astragalus and ligustrum, where they find that when they gave that, those two herbs to animals with kidney cancer, depending upon how much kidney cancer they gave the animals, if they gave them a, a high amount of kidney cancer cells, then it, it cured them in 57% by helping their immune system uh, engulf the cancer better. If they gave them um, less cancer, they, um, then there was a better response. So it depends. This is something if, if after surgery, there's a lot of cancer that's been removed and there's just maybe trace amounts, astragalus and gustrum could have an effect. Running out of time, but there's also research done on Japanese mandarin. There's research done on mistletoe. So there's all kinds of things that have an immune effect against kidney cancer. Uh, I'll try to touch on some of this next week, but I was going to focus on leukemia next week um, too. Um, so I uh, hope you enjoyed today's show. This is Cancer Concepts and Compliments. Thank you for joining us this week. Cancer Concepts and Compliments with Dr. James Belanger can be heard live every Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific Time, 9 a.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We hope to see you next week for another show. Thank you.